welcome again. <laughs> this is Russ and C++ Cardiff. Brief housekeeping, we have a Twitter, an email, and a Discord. And our objective is just generally to learn some stuff that we think is cool. Esri, um, several of us work for Esri, so they're our main sponsor of the, the Meetup page, allows us to exist. Our code of conduct boils down to just be good to each other. And that's more for in-person meetups, but we try to be as inclusive as possible with the pack memory for leaving space in conversations. This is week five of our book club, taking us on to chapters nine and 10. Brief recap on what we've covered so far. We've been through the installation, doing the hello world, getting up speed with cargo. We started covering the initial kind of basic programming concepts and ownership. Moved on to structs and enums and pattern matching, and then started to look at using packages and crates to grow your project. This week, we are getting into some really fun meaty parts on chapter, in the form of chapter nine and 10, error handling. And then chapter 10 is gonna be generics, traits, and lifetimes. So without further ado, I will hand over to Richard. Thanks, Kira. Uh, let's see if I can get this. Stop the other person sharing. Yep. This is bound to all work. Can you see my screen? Yes. Excellent. Hi, for, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Richard Shepherd. Uh, I work with Kira and Chris uh, and Alex at Esri. Um, feel free to interrupt as I'm going through this. Um, I'm not entirely confident. I'll spot if you send a chat through, um, but I'm, I'm quite happy to be interrupted and try and answer questions or hopefully have the others help out. Uh, so without further ado, I'll plow into error handling. Uh, in Rust, uh, Rust, or the, certainly the Rust book, describes error handling primarily in, in two ways, um, either a controllable problem, a uh, manageable problem, um, or uh, an uncontrollable problem, uh, a panic. Um, panic is the, is the simplest and probably the first thing you'll encounter if you have uh, simple runtime errors like uh, an access violation into an array. Um, the panic macro, uh, although I don't think we've covered macros at all yet. Um, but, so I mostly think about them just as a function for now. Uh, the panic macro just uh, aborts the program and prints a can print a failure message. Uh, it doesn't instantly abort the program or by default. Um, it will unwind from where your problem occurs, uh, cleaning up as it goes. So typically closing any files, um, any other objects that you've created that need destructing and managing resources, it'll have a chance to clean those up. And then finally it'll quit. Um, turns out there, 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 is a, there are a few exceptions to that, uh, or, but I'll show you some examples first. Uh, you can call panic yourself directly, uh, as I've done in the first example in the main. Um, this is a main program that will not run for very long. It will instantly um, uh, panic. It'll abort uh, after printing crash and burn uh, out to the uh, output stream. Um, or you may be more likely to encounter panics um, when they are called by functions or libraries that you're using. In this case, uh, I've got a, a vector with three elements um, and you can see I'm trying to access the ninth element. Um, thinking about it now, is, I was just wondering if uh, the Rust compiler would actually be clever enough to catch that at static uh, analysis time, given that everything's literal. Uh, but assuming this was a slightly more variable example where it couldn't predict it ahead of time, this would throw your panic. Yes, the actual unwind in the stack can be quite expensive because it's got to remember all the points uh, in the queue um, or in the, in the, the stack to um, take the uh, memory back to, if you like. If you were trying to minimize the size of your application and the speed it runs at, um, then you can um, uh, set the configuration to automatically abort. So as soon as there's a problem, uh, you can abort the uh, execution. Uh, you can also get more information out of it. If you build and run with backtrace set, then when you have a panic, you'll get a whole stack dump. Um, by default, this is on for debug builds, uh, although not for runtime ones. So panic is uh, the, the simplest way for the more controlled way of managing problems uh, in your functions. Um, the recommended or the, the standard way of 
you doing it in Rust is to use the result object. Um, it's quite interesting. The result object is still a, a simple enum um, within Rust that you know, looks like you could just build it yourself as part of a library, but at the same time, the language itself uh, has support for it, um, as we'll see in a minute. Uh, the basic um, the result enum allows you to um, return either the result that your function would ideally if everything was uh, going well um, or um, to provide an error uh, output um, if there's been a problem uh, which can give you uh, more information so in the example we've got here we're trying to use a file function uh, this returns a result object uh, the advantage of result objects um, over just returning um, a, a, a simple result or a magic number is that we are forced to deal with it as a result object. Uh, you can ignore it and blithely assume um, that it's uh, going to work uh, and plow on through it. So in this case, we can see we're using Rust's match functionality to check whether the result was good, in which case it'll be using the OK value of the enum um, with the file as its value. Uh, which in this case we want to assign to f um, or if there was an error then we can manually call panic um, output the error information uh, you can do more complicated uh, responses um, to uh, error handling so in this case we've got several levels of matching being done taking the initial response if it's a good file great we use it if it's not a good file then we check what kind of error we've got back um, if it was a not found error then we try creating it again we've got a nested uh, attempt to, mat, um, to match the information coming back from the file create if it was a good file great we use it after all uh, otherwise we panic and give up uh, equally we've got uh, similarly got, we've still got the first error if it was a if it wasn't a not found then we can return from that as well so this is already neater error handling than a lot of languages allow um, but as the book uh, rapidly points out this is actually considered sort of fairly basic um, or sort of manual uh, error handling and that rust has um, some nicer uh, abilities built in that allow you to uh, handle common situations more simply um, in this case we're using lambdas um, where we either want to unwrap and use the correct information if it was successful or if it wasn't successful then it'll automatically apply the lambdas so we've got similar logic to what we just used but uh, using passing in as lambdas rather than um, uh, as uh, match statements to do it all at one level um, if we were happy um, just having a, a panic, then you can turn a result into a panic easily just by using the unwrap function. So then you're guaranteed it'll it'll either panic and give up, um, or you'll be getting back the value you were expecting. Um, somewhere in between, you can use the expect functionality, uh, so it'll panic, um, but with your chosen error message, um, or give you the results you want. Uh, quite often within Rust, you'll be wanting to actually pass the error information on, not deal with it all yourself. So a simple example here is where in a function, if you've got uh, file errors, um, uh, either creating or opening the file or in reading strings from it, we're going to uh, return the in error information uh, out of our function. So our function now, instead of returning uh, a number or a string that we might want, returns a result itself. So it's added a bit of logic, it's done a bit of processing, it's encapsulated the file name and how to uh, deal with it, but then returning either the result or a problem um, from the files to give the callers a chance to decide what they want to do about the files. Uh, in this case, we're actually passing the same or having the same error type that we're passing out is the same as the one that we encountered internally, but we could easily have created our own application specific error type and just extract some of the information from the errors um, or build our own error from scratch. Uh, there is, sorry, Kira. I saw a thing recently, I think they're planning to move some of those error types down into core. I meant they're in the standard library in Rust, but they're planning to move it low down for, because in certain kind of embedded cases, they don't necessarily want to pull in the entire um, standard library. 
so they, they're moving some stuff down to court. I don't know the details, but I just thought I would share that tidbit of information that it's a work in progress and move that down. No, okay, very so useful if you, you now know uh, you've got certain common error types um, that you can rely on being there. I mean, C++ did have that originally, but then they had a lot of trouble in the following years where they, they weren't actually terribly happy with the hierarchy of error types that they'd made standard. So it'd be interesting to see if uh, Rust has more success. Um, one of the cutest things in Rust is that you can short circuit the normal match process uh, and replace it with the syntactic sugar of the um, question mark at the end of your function. Uh, so as far as I can see, that's pretty much a direct replacement. Um, the second code is a direct replacement for the first code. Just plonk in your question mark on the end. We'll do the same as, unfortunately can't select things on here. Um, uh, as the whole match and either accepting the result or returning an error. You can only use the question mark if the function you're in does return a result. Uh, otherwise, this return error part wouldn't work. Does it work with option as well? I think I read somewhere it works with the option type too. Uh, that is uh, very likely. Uh, I'm just wondering what it'll return in that case. Because um, will it just, because the option itself is has either got a value or is uninitialized. So I suppose um, the return could return. Um, could it return just, an option of the yeah. Would be an, an an uninitialized option. So I suppose yes. If your if your function was returning a different higher level option, then the question mark could just return the um, uninitialized value from that. Yep, that mm, would make yeah, sense. Makes, makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Um, so look, just going back quickly back to if we use the question mark on our early examples, then um, they, they shrink down uh, a lot. Uh, the second example is particularly nice. You can see how you're starting to chain them together. I'm sure I've seen similar syntax in C Sharp that they have um, the ability to pass on uh, nulls uh, or not nulls. They can, they can either return if it is a null or they can go on with the process and if it's not a null. The, yeah, the the question mark is yeah yeah like the null coalescing kind of thing, but it doesn't do this kind of nice package up return error type type thing. It just um yeah it just allows you to to chain null checks, so it would just put null into your object if um if it doesn't manage to get all the way to the end of your null. So check. it's more like the uh, the option idea that we were just similarly for JavaScript, right? Probably yeah <laughs> yeah. So it's, yeah, a little bit simpler. Um. Uh, so quickly, um, whether to panic or not, um, which which one should you use? Sorry, um, because I think okay. there is also like a limitation on the type that the result result contains, right? So if you want to propagate nicely those types, the error type, it has to be convertible from the type being written by the call function, right? Yes, that would make sense. I think the examples in the book, they use the same type, uh, both. But yeah, I guess if they were different types, it would have to be something that had a constructor that could build one error from the other. I think there is a trait that they need to implement like from the other type, and then it would work automatically. Sorry for that. Yep, uh, that sounds uh, most likely you're ahead of me in the book. <laughs> um, Times when you might want to use panic rather than a result. Uh, things that should never happen. I'm not sure that's massively helpful advice. Um, the, the fact that all the subsequent code really can't continue uh, unless that particular line was going to work. Um, there's nothing sensible you can do. Maybe if you're doing initial prototyping, trying things out, um, you're not interested in building up a, a lot of extensive uh, scaffolding. You just want to you want to push some numbers through it that you know all exist and no work, and just want to see that it does come up with the sorts of results you want. Um, performance is an interesting one that, that I was looking at. If you if you're looping through. Um, for, I mean, the example I was looking at recently was something like a raster or something. And if you were looping through all the pixels, as you could go to each pixel with an index, do you really want that pixel lookup to be doing a load of bounds checking when you've already done the bounds checking before you created your loop um, so that you're pretty certain everything's there? So there may be times where you know things are going to be used uh, in tight loops where 
you want the um, decision making to have already been done before the loop is started rather than every time within it. So you'd set up your code to panic rather than return optionals that would need to be checked all the time. Uh, in general, uh, it's easier to return a result into a panic, uh, but you can turn a panic or you, you can catch a panic and do something more managed with it and regain control um, if you use the uh, panic catch and wind uh, function. Uh, I can't remember exactly how. But uh, it's, I guess that that's more of a use if you're if you're needing to control a third party library where you can't change uh, how its her handling is working internally. Uh, so, sorry, is it, go ahead. is it fair to say that an exception? Is, sorry, a panic is a, analogous to a, an exception. It's I mean exceptions in C plus plus. They they were designed to encourage you to catch them and do things with them. Whereas I get the impression panic, you're not really expected to do anything with them. It's, it's sort of, it, Rust seems to have a clearer divide between results and panics. Mm -hmm. um, whereas C++ plus exceptions sort of sit sit in the middle. They, they can give you information back like a result does, um, but they, 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 they can also be unusable. You can only catch them at the top level of the application and just move on to the next task. Um, or they can be misused by lots of developers and turned into control flow. Yeah, I suppose uh, that's why I thought they might be similar to exceptions. <laughs> Whereas uh, certainly uh, it, it, for that scenario where it's control flow, Rust would definitely be pushing you towards results. Uh, I think I think this is also what the asynchronous frameworks are doing. So like when they have the workers threads, they let the code being executed, but at the, at, at the very top of running of that thread, thread yep. that they, they just... <laughs> we have a popular yeah. book club. <laughs> yeah, so, 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 so they just basically catch uh, and, uh, and let the process, the other processes continue instead of the application to be uh, killed. Yep. Which sounds a bit like in Erlang or something where they, they typically just allow things to die and then just get other processes to um, spin up and run their processes instead. Yeah, I have the same idea. Uh, finally, uh, third and, and very uh, can be very helpful form of uh, managing errors is actually to stop them early before they happen um, by, by using the, 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 the static typing to stop you having any invalid cases. Um, for instance, rather than your routine having to take an option and then having to do check-in, does the option exist or not, and potentially return an optional result itself, if your function uh, guarantees that it's always going to have a valid value um, and can work with it, then you're always going to get an answer out of it. And that essentially just shifts the check-in one level up so that um, the, the, the calls outside your function are having to deal with any optional um, problems. If a whole type is still too generous, um, then you could create your own um, type that that, that um, will only, only allow the correct or supported values. The example given in the book was uh, an integer between one and 100 is what your function expects. If it gets that, it's guaranteed to work. Um, but how do you guarantee that on input? In their case, they created a small guess, um, guess struct that can only be constructed with values between one and 100. So if you were going to construct one of these, but then use it 100 times, you've just saved yourself doing all the, the checking uh, 99 times you've only done the check-in once uh, and shifted uh, the uh, check-in away from the algorithms. Uh, this is th this particularly these sorts of types that are quite strongly correct is something I'm very interested in and trying to experiment with in uh, in my day job to try and uh, make some problems more difficult to get things like I'm interested in things like having a vector that's guaranteed to have at least one element so that I don't have to keep doing special cases for empty vectors. Uh, uh, so I'm quite interested in this sort of strong typing for entry values to try and uh, make things safer without having to have error checking everywhere. Uh, and I think that was all the book uh, had in that chapter, chapter nine on uh, 
uh, errors, uh, panics and re results, unless anyone's got any other questions, I can move on with the other chapter. So just about those types with invariants, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So so yeah, this this is something that I, I also like uh, saw people in C++ community are doing, but it feels like the Rust people are, and I, I don't know for what reason, but it seems like uh, the Rust people more like more of those types, right? Kind of those types. Having, having seen some of the C++ talks, my first reaction is people in Rust like it because it's a darn sight easier to create them in Rust. Uh, it's it's quite a lot of work to create a good one in uh, C++, even, even for simple things, because you end, particularly if you want it to act like an integer, if you wanted your guest class to actually start having arithmetic operators on it and be comparable against an int, it gets quite messy. If you're, if you're happy with a, a simple class like this where you're going to extract the value um, using a value method, it should be fairly straightforward even in C++. But yeah, the syntax of Rust does make it really easy to spin these new types up. It's yeah. about establishing invariants on the construction, right? Yeah. It's just when the invariant is not held, then the only option uh, in C++ is to throw or to use something like a static constructor. Yeah, exactly. So in one of the projects I'm involved in, that nearly all their constructors are in fact replaced by um, create methods that return pointers so that uh, you, you've got a chance to fail, whereas the, the constructor doesn't give you it, but then you have to mm -hmm. check them all. Cool. I had uh, one thing to mention, which is one thing that I liked about the error handling rest is all of the nice helpers they have. So all of the like yep. unwrap or do this or da, da, da. I just I just think it's yeah very very nice. Um, and then one other thing with the with the unwinding of the stack, I guess one thing that I thought was kind of important to note is that when you it kind of mentions that when you build in release, you don't actually get the debug symbols. You have to turn them on. Yep. It doesn't bother for you. So that's just something. Um, I'm sure we. When you found out, you could then just generate them and then you're fine. But it's just, yeah, it, I, I thought, well, why doesn't everyone do that? And that actually makes a lot of sense. <laughs> why waste time generating the debug symbols if you don't need them? And they're useless anyway. <laughs> well, that's it. Try and set up the most useful defaults you can. It's, it's like uh, in, in the production code, do you think that lots of companies are building without the symbols? Like with CMake, what we are running usually is release with the bug symbols. So if there is some problem encountered, we can easily... Uh, figure out what is the stack trace, right? So, what is, yeah. mm -hmm. Sorry. I was going to say, do you just keep the symbols locally to you, so that, or, or are they distributed with the actual uh, application? No, we, we, we keep in our own, uh, like, oh, how is it called? Oh, on our build server, right? yeah. uh, or Nexus, whatever. Uh, and uh, then if there is a panic somewhere else, we just uh, get the stack trace and we post-mortem uh, an analyze it. I guess the question would be whether it makes the executable itself any larger or whether so, it's just slowing down the build, uh, in which case you maybe just do it on release builds. Um, so release with the bug symbols, in C uh, it, it's like still applying O2 or something. It's not going to... Uh, 03, I think, at least with like GCC, but uh, like from what uh, what I was reading, it doesn't have much impact on the performance. But it's not something that, again that uh, that CMA gives you by default, for instance, right? Yeah. No. Well, like... When you go release, yeah. Good point, Christophe. Okay, I shall jump over to the longer uh, and for me more more difficult uh, section particularly uh, with lifetimes where we're getting things that are genuinely quite different to other languages i've worked with in the past it took a bit more getting my head around um, at least dealing with them directly um, so chapter 10 is about generic types traits and lifetimes at first i was a bit surprised they were all squashed together but then i after a while i could see it's all to do with generics where you get the angle brackets uh, and they basically you, you're starting to implicitly or explicitly work with uh, abstractions that are standing in either for, for concrete types in the simple case um, or for other properties um, when we get to traits and lifetimes. Um, so very briefly, um, the chapter itself starts off with an introduction 
just on making things generic. Uh, in particular, it suggests the idea of just a simple function um, that doesn't do anything unusual, just takes a list um, uh, of ints, uh, is, is already an abstraction. It's already a generic version of writing the code twice or every time that you've got a different list uh, of information. So th this was a very simple idea of just, you make your computation generic by capturing it once in a function. Um, taking the idea further, rather than it just being taking a list of ints, we can make it generic over the uh, type that you've got a list of. So in this case, a type T. Um, so your first pass at writing this would just be to take your non-generic version um, of ints and just replace the type with the generic type. In our case, we've uh, used the letter T uh, and then use the uh, extra angle brackets T at the beginning to introduce the fact we're going to have a, a, I'm sure I'm going to slip up and say template, uh, a generic parameter uh, T. This looks like it should work, um, but it won't build because turns out there are, you know, Rust is quite careful uh, about what you're going to use. It is not like C++ where it uses duct typing and assumes that it'll only check things when you actually try and apply the function. In Rust's case, it will immediately say, uh, an abstract type T does not know how to do a less than comparison, so I'm not going to even let you start off with this. Uh, so that was a bit of a shock to me in the first place. Uh, but we'll solve that in a sec. Uh, apart from parameterizing functions, you can parameterize types. Uh, for instance, a simple um, point type. In this case, we've constrained both elements to have, be of the same type. Um, examples we've already seen in other contexts, things like options and results um, can easily be parameterized with types. Result is an example of using two different types um, to construct different parts of it. Again, there's no limitations on these. Um, and it's a little goal in how easy it is to create a new type that's actually quite useful. Um, if you want to then start implementing methods um, on your function, you rapidly realize that you need to keep mentioning the type. It's not like in C++ where you could uh, embed the function implementation inside the struct and have it just assume it um, because your implementations are outside the struct definition you are having to clarify that you do mean um, the point that's in you, know, the generic point, it's templatized by the, uh, the, the type parameter, um, but you can then use it internally. If you, your methods themselves can use additional type parameters um, completely independently of the struct they're involved in. The, the example they gave was a slightly contrived one where you're uh, effectively creating one new point from two existing points, but mixing up the types of it. Um, so all the, the types themselves are all um, strictly worked out, or, uh, worked out statically uh, at compile time. Um, and we are assured that the performance using generics will be as good as if you'd handwritten all the different versions yourself. I guess this is in contrast to early Java type or OO ideas where everything would be polymorphic. So you'd be having to follow um, pointers uh, at runtime. Um, the generics in Rust are much closer to C++ type templates um, where it does all the work. Apparently using a process called monomorphization, uh, which I hadn't come across as a, a name for it. But yeah, the static analysis just allows it to produce the different versions of the generics depending on how many you're going to use, or what varieties you're going to use. Uh, moving on to traits, these allow us to start um, clustering together behaviors or trying to define a class of behavior. So they're, they're a bit like the concept of uh, interfaces in other languages like Java or C++. Uh, in this case, we use the, the traits keyword to introduce um, something that looks like it could be a, a struct, um, except I guess uh, we're introducing the function. Uh, in this case, we're saying that a trait called summary uh, is going to have a function. We don't give any body to the function. We're just saying that anything else that wants to be considered a summary is going to have to implement this summarize function with uh, precisely that um, uh, signature. So I, I know this Sainsbury's has just arrived. I'm just checking someone else has heard. Yep. <laughs> um, so in this case, we've got an example of a tweet struct. Um, 
that we want to um, be able to be used in contexts where a summary is expected. Uh, so in this case, the notify function will work with anything that um, supports the summary trait. Uh, and we want it to work for our tweets. This was a little bit of a surprise. This is when I realized that uh, Rust uh, traits are quite different to um, the sort of duck typing that you might use the same thing for in C++. I was slightly surprised. I, I kind of assumed that Rust would, in your notify function, would only notice when you tried to pass a tweet to it, it would just check, do you have all the things that summary needs? But so I was slightly surprised you have to actually declare that you are implementing summary for tweet or for whatever structures uh, you're creating. Um, I guess just take a little bit of getting used to. I, I kind of assumed that uh, structures would automatically uh, be able to be used in any trait contexts if they happen to have those functions on them, that you wouldn't have to actually declare why you were doing it. Particularly, it made me wonder what happens if you're defining the summarize function because several traits need it um, with the same signature, but um, do you have to define it multiple times or would just one of them do? I don't know if anyone knows. No, I hadn't thought about it until you started saying it. Then I was like, that's a good point. <laughs> what does happen then? Um, yeah, so um, anyone have to have a look things to play with. Uh, there was something else that uh, surprised me, or it sort of led on to other thoughts. I thought, well, because the next thing um, that was described in the chapter was that your, your traits can provide default uh, implementations so that when you're implementing tweet and saying that tweet is uh, an example uh, of summary or implements summary, you don't have to actually write the function. I thought, well, in that case, I've got no functions to implement. Do I do I even need to put the implement the impl statement? Uh, and the answer is yes, you do. Uh, so you you do need an empty impl summary for tweet statement in order for tweet to be considered um, for summary context. So that was what got me thinking about um, complications with it. Um, On the to... other hand, right, it might be a safety feature. Oh yeah, because you might be by mistake passing your type to some function that takes one trait, but uh, you, you were like trying to really pass it to something else, but you made a typo or something, right? Yeah, so definitely. just about the explicitness of your code. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I can see I can see why they do it. Um, I did, it just caught me slightly by surprise and made me wonder what happens if when you've got um, your structs that are implementing multiple uh, traits and how, how, how soon you're going to start getting clashes but we'll find out with experience. So um, the, the, you can, sorry. so it looks like you can disambiguate. So it's, it, yeah, it, the reason they're doing it is so that you can have more than one um, function name with the same one. And that input block does mean that you can then use a fully qualified form of the function. Call I, yeah, I see. So, so in your notify statement, for instance, um, where you were calling summarize, you could tell it, I suppose in this case, we know we've implemented summary, but you could tell it was the summary summarize that you were, you were interested in. Yeah. So like, say for example, you had two get methods, then you would have call syntax that looked like this, which put it in the chat. So if you have a type that's form and it implements age widget, but it also implements, what's the other example they give? Um, username widget, then their get method for the age widget gets the age, but their get method for the, name widget gets the name and yep. then that way this way you can call the correct get method and it will it will know which one which one to get so there you go yep thanks for that kira uh moving on uh, okay actually using the traits in your code um when you've got functions that want to be able to rely on um generic types you've got multiple uh, options from the, the simplest ones where you just use it instead of a type in the signature, uh, as in the first one, uh, in which case you have to, you do have to use the keyword impl, which again, slightly surprised me. I thought, well, if you need one at all, I'd kind of expect that to be trait rather than impl. Um, but I'm sure there are reasons for it. Um, or you can start 
using the normal generics notation um, with the angle brackets ahead of it, um, which gives you a bit more power. You might have multiple uh, parameters that all want to be noticeably of the same type. So this isn't this third example isn't just saying that both types support summary. It's saying both types are the same. Uh, if you wanted to allow potentially different types that both support summary, you'd have to use two different trait, uh, two, sorry, two different generic parameters, T1 and T2, T and U. Uh, the third example is showing where you potentially you've enforced the first parameter to um, support summary, but you don't care about the second, it could be anything. Um, there is a different one again, where things get more complicated, you can um, require multiple uh, traits uh, to be used, um, or that the, rather that your type supports several traits. Again, you can use the uh, generic notation, uh, and it also might become more useful to use the where notation, where you um, specify everything uh, after the fact. This actually reminded me of very old C compilers where um, parameter types could all be specified after the signature, if I remember rightly. That was a long time ago. Um, what you do notice, with, I mean, the where notation is very explicit and clean and allows you to keep everything on separate lines. You have by now got up to duplicating things three times. Um, if you compare it to where we started, where uh, you just had it once uh, in the um, actual signature. So the, the clarity, you know, I guess you'll use the more verbose versions when, when, when it's worth it. Um, return values can also um, be used traits. Uh, it was suggested in the book that these are useful for things like closures and iterators where the types are difficult to have any access to. Um, the one that occurred to me is where you, if you're creating a trait um, and part of your specification includes um, functions that are going to return other traits, um, then you, you'd be using them there. And so it's then up to the implementations of, of your trait um, that they need to make sure their return type supports the requested ones so that so you can start interoperating with your traits. Um, that's in the most likely use for return types or return traits. Uh, there is one extra complication, which I haven't looked ahead yet to see what the surprise is. But uh, if your if your function is actually potentially going to return, I, I, in fact, I think it was quite strong. Um, if you may have several different return statements in your function, then you can't just return uh, a trait, even if both or all of your possible returns all would support that trait. Uh, even if they're all the same class, I don't think uh, it allows it, um, or sorry, the same the same type. Um, but uh, we've been promised that there, there are techniques for, for dealing with this, um, which we will get to in a later in a later chapter and later week. And going back to our initial example with our largest function, we now know how to fix it, or at least we know, now know how to understand the error. Um, that um, we, a generic trait doesn't know how to understand greater than, doesn't have it supported. So if we uh, constrain that to be in any type that supports um, partial ordering, then now it does know how to. Um, work with a greater than symbol, but we still have errors because it doesn't know how to extract an element from a list, or rather, it doesn't know how to copy an element from a list in general. Um, to get that ability, we have to also add copyability to the type so that it, we know it can definitely be copied, and it now compiles um, and it's happy. Uh, it was only at this point I suddenly thought, why are we even returning it by value? Um, surely you'd, if it's an element of the list, you'd want to return it by reference anyway. Um, and then I started thinking, well, hang on, in C++, I couldn't just start off with my largest being a reference and then overwrite it with different elements because that doesn't do what I want. And that got me thinking again about Rust references, and I realized I just hadn't fully understood that they're not quite the same as C++ references. Uh, in that with Rust references, you can change what you're referring to, or you can change the value of what you're currently referring to. Um, 
but yeah, that, that, that it, took, it took me a little while to get to, to, to figure that out and then realize that's how I could write my largest function. It also worried me following on from the error handling chapter that we hadn't checked for an empty list in here. But <laughs> I'm sure you'd soon find out why well, it would panic, presumably. Uh, okay, there is uh, one last complication was that you might want to specify, uh, you, you can constrain some of your functions um, that you're implementing. Um, so that in this case, we've got a struct um, and we are saying that we would, that the, the compare display function is only available if the type supports both display and partial uh, and otherwise it isn't um, which I'd stop and think for a bit it, it, it makes sense uh, and be very useful um, but yeah I, I got a bit confused reading it the wrong way around um, to begin with as, as to, to what it was enforcing um, I don't know how much people who have used Rust um, more uh, in their day jobs have actually found themselves using traits uh, a lot or, or in, in particular more complicated aspects of it uh, using constraints on them uh, and certainly in C++ it's it's come pretty late to the party sort of all the enable if and uh, all the sort of meta programming uh, given that it's built into Rust from the start how much have people found themselves using it? I think when, when you start like even even just with the kind of any toy stuff, you immediately start implementing, like using traits that already exist because usually they're kind of needed for everything. <laughs> like, you know, you want to print something? Oh, you need to implement that trait. Oh, you want to copy it? You better implement the copy trait. And then um, I quite like that. Um, and this kind of notion of like conditionally implementing functions in, in your template programming, I think is really, really cool. The idea that like you've got your template for stamping out functions, but then you're not necessarily going to stamp out all of those functions mm -hmm. on your class, depending on what the type is. And then you can go even more kind of broad brush and say, actually, it doesn't matter specifically what the type is, but it just has to implement this. And that gives you some really nice flexibility, even just for kind of prototyping it. It's kind of nice to have. You might then shore it up. But initially, when you're not sure what's going to have what, you can just kind of play around with it. Uh, I got to admit, I first hit traits um, when I was trying to overload something, something like the plus operator. I wanted to work if I were or the, the multiply operator. I was multiplying different things together and I couldn't. It was driving me nuts because it wouldn't let me have more than one of them. I thought this can't be right. And yeah, led me to discover traits. Sorry, Christoph, you were about to say something. Uh, so, so the trait is very similar to concept in C++, right? Yeah. But from what I've read, I haven't used concepts a lot, but uh, what, what they were saying is that you should not be really introducing concepts until you're very, very sure and you have like a library. Whereas with uh, Rust traits, it seems like, yeah, you have an idea, just add a trait to it, right? It does seem a lot simpler and more straightforward in the language rather than something pretty complicated that they've... I, I think the worry in C++ is once you add them, you it, what, uh, certainly if you release a a, a a constraint then it becomes extremely difficult to remove or change it um presumably particularly to tighten it and I, I wonder if rust has been around long enough to hit such problems where once they've released a crate with it they then potentially hit problems if they want to change it later what, what what's cool though is, is so you can only implement a trait on a class if you own either the class or the trait and then that means that you don't end up with people kind of messing it up it's like one person has kind of the ownership it's, it's your trait you can you know then do what you like if it's someone else's trait in someone else's class then you don't you don't have the power to do that so you're less right. likely to back yourself into a corner you need to own one of either the trait or the class it's quite yeah, Smart I wonder. <laughs> I wonder if that came out of analyzing the, the, the areas that C++ uh... Uh, is terrified of <laughs> because this way you could also like modify behavior not only in your code right but also in the library that you're using mm -hmm. so that, that's like a safety again <laughs> I, mean, so, I, yeah. I, I guess you can't override what someone has specified in a trait you can only really use it to constrain things further so it should be safe 
it's not even a constraint really the trait is more of just a description of behavior that's how i think of it is you know it's it's not changing the underlying object it's just saying look here's what you can do with this thing yeah and then on your function you're then saying look you need to be able to do this in order to work so i think that's what makes it feel a bit freer as well as it's just kind of it's extending functionality rather than kind of pe- pe- kind of pairing you back i find it like a really helpful to Again, I'm not using it often, right? But I find it like a helpful tool for interface segregation. Mm-hmm. So you, you, you can just specify, oh, this class has that, 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 and that interface. And then when you're using, you just narrow it to the smallest interface that you would be really wanting. Whereas in like C++, if you wanted to do something like that, you would have to write an adapter path, adapter pattern for a thing, which is, again, lots of boilerplate, right? Yes, exactly. I or, mean, all, all of this... or you use inheritance, right? But that has its own problem. Yeah. I mean, it's getting easier. They're, they're adding more meta programming and they might add some language elements that are syntactic sugar on it. But yeah, it's still, it's a, it feels like quite a chore, um, both to use and to convince existing, you know, to teach existing programmers how to use it uh, and how to implement it. Okay, pushing on. Uh, lifetimes, uh, last chunk. Um, every, in particular, uh, this is all about references, not values. Um, references, uh, we've used them or, already in Rust, and uh, a lot of the time, uh, the lifetime can be inferred, um, but sometimes it needs to be annotated, which is what this, this section of the chapter was about. It's a bit analogous to types. A lot of the time in Rust, you don't need to put the type. You can just infer it uh, from what it's being used for or what's being assigned to it. But sometimes you need to uh, clarify the type. Similarly, sometimes you need to clarify the lifetime. Um, let's have a look at the, the, the problem we're trying to solve first um, is um, the, the dangling reference problem, where in this case, we, we've got R, which is going to be a, a reference, um, and it gets given its reference uh, at a perfectly valid time in the, in the middle um, when X exists, um, but then it doesn't get used until after the thing it refers to has died um, and we've lost. And, and this, this is the, the typical scenario that Rust will refuse to compile for you, whereas C would be extremely happy to compile this for you uh, unless you turn on. I mean, there's some of the checkers now I've started playing with recently that will start to spot things like this. Um, but yeah, that's the, it's, it's pretty much seems to be one of the central ideas for Rust is to uh, track and spot these problems. Uh, just to clarify uh, for anyone else who's new to what it's trying to check, um, what Rust is doing is looking at um, how long the different elements uh, are alive and checking that their lifetimes are compatible with the usage. In particular, this B lifetime in the center um, is is not so much interested in X itself, it's interested in the, the reference to X that's being created. Um, and, and this was an idea that seemed to come through in the chapter several times to me, but the, there's almost an intermediate object. There, there's, the, there's the thing you're taking a reference of, there's the thing you're assigning it to, uh, but then there's the reference itself that sort of sits in the middle. Um, and it's the lifetime of that reference that's sitting in the middle that is what Rust is adding. To everything, it, it, it's, it's tracking the lifetime of that, the thing that uh, R is currently connected to, uh, and it's getting upset when R tries to be used when R was still pointing at the reference, but that reference's lifetime has now finished. Um, the apparently the correct uh, why has it got ticks on the wrong side? Ticks are always before the letter, aren't they? That's just my typo. Uh, looking at it in a function context, we're taking in two references, passing out a reference to one of them. Um, our code seems simple enough. What Rust is unhappy about is that it doesn't know um, exactly which lifetime you mean. Uh, it doesn't know which of these parameters to connect it to. Uh, if it was connected to both and they end up with two different lifetimes, it doesn't know how to constrain the result it's getting out. So in our case, we can see perfectly well that it would be valid. They both live quite long enough, um, but that's not good enough for us. It wants us to clarify it. Uh, so in this case, you can start to clarify that both of the parameters have the same lifetime. 
Before you can do that, you need to introduce the lifetime as a generic parameter uh, using the same angle bracket notation as we saw for other generics. Uh, and then you can clarify that your return type has the same lifetime. So this is going to uh, tell the Rust uh, compiler that when you're using this result, um, you don't expect to ever use it outside of the lifetime of both the input parameters. Uh, and because it now is happy with your intended uses of it, it'll let you compile the function. When it goes on to check your calling code, it can now use this, oh, damn, keep clicking on it and going forward. It'll now use the signature um, when it's compiling the calling function and can do the analysis to check that you're not using the result for any longer than the two parameters that are passed in, because that's what your signature said it would do. Um, so we can see that uh, slightly clearer in this example, where, for instance, the usage of it is inside the lifetime of the second string. Um, we can, if we look at the overlapping lifetimes, we can see, yep, the Rust compiler is going to be happy with that. If we move the print line um, outside the second, uh, uh, sorry, the inner braces, then it's no longer happy because result might be pointing, we don't know, it might be pointing to string two, which no longer exists. Um, so it stops us making those sorts of mistakes. I did quickly see if I could cheat. Um, if I, uh, you, you, oh, there should be a comma B in there. Uh, there was in my code example. Uh, if you try and do that, it'll promptly complain that um, you might have a path through this um, for which the parameter isn't connected to the return um, and it's not going to let you compile that. It did seem to me like theoretically, assuming the compiler could see all the code, it could actually, it could do without you annotating the lifetimes and it could just look at all the times you're calling this function and the variables you're passing through and it could tell you if there's going to be a definite problem or not. Um, but I could see that maybe with crates and independent modules, uh, it wouldn't be able to see the internals. And also maybe it just makes the compiler's job a lot quicker. If it, if it can compartmentalize the job, it only has to worry about lifetime analysis within the function or outside the function. It means it only ever has to deal with one function at a time. Whereas if it was trying to infer the lifetimes of everything all over the place, it would have a massive job. Um, but I have no knowledge about the compiler. So uh, that's, that's a completely a guess on my part. I think also the lifetime management making it explicit at every function boundary probably helps programmers themselves um, be much clearer about their intent, um, which parts they expect the lifetime to correspond to. Um, I know I'm running out of time, but uh, should just about make it. Uh, you can also specify uh, lifetimes for structs um, if they're containing um, members that are also references. So you can guarantee that no one's going to try and use a part of your struct. Oh, uh, which way around is it? Not going to use a part of your struct uh, longer than the lifetime of the. No, can't use the. You can't use the struct for any longer than the lifetime of the thing you've assigned to the element of the struct. Um, noticeably, uh, again, um, as part of your function declaration, uh, like we saw before with generics, the generic parameter, in this case, the lifetime, is also part of the impl statement. Uh, you can't just leave it out. Uh, this only just fitted on one slide. Um, there are a couple of cases where you don't have to specify the lifetime um, and Rust will work it out for you. Um, so it uses three basic rules. Um, in particular, if there's only a single parameter going in, a uh, reference going in and a reference going out, um, then it'll assume that those two are going to have the same lifetime. Um, so effectively, it's the same as, oh, sorry, sorry, uh, rushing ahead. Uh, if there's only, uh, sorry, First rule the compiler uses is to assign a lifetime to every parameter. In this case, there is only one parameter, so we get one lifetime. The second rule it has is that if there is only one parameter, it'll assume that the output has the same lifetime. Uh, and thirdly, if, if there are multiple parameters, but one of them is self, um, 
so this is a, would be an object method rather than a free function, then it assumes that your output uh, is going to be for the, uh, going to have the same lifetime as the object you're acting on, uh, because those are the most common cases. If you try and write a function um, that doesn't, um, if you try and return something that isn't coming from the object, then the compiler will catch it uh, and uh, you, you'd have to be, you'd have to correct the lifetime specification in your signature if it wasn't a part of the uh, the self object. Uh, it does suggest in the book that this list of heuristics may grow as they discover other rules that are useful and reliable enough um, to use. Although that would be interesting. Would that actually change existing code potentially if they had extra inferences? I it guess not. Because you it, wouldn't have to specify it. Yeah, than... exactly. So existing stuff would all pass either because of the existing rules um, or yeah, must do. So yeah, it'd be just existing cases where you have specifies that you might be able to turn that off. Yeah. I'm sure they've thought about it longer and harder than I have. <laughs> um, in summary, uh, the generic types um, that we started off with allow you to write the same code for multiple types. Um, the traits and trait bounds allow you to ensure that you've got the behavior you're going to need uh, so you can use generics uh, more reliably and with faster uh, error checking at compile time. Uh, and the lifetimes ensure you haven't got any dangling references. Uh, and I added this bit myself. The as far as I can see, the lifetime annotations clarify the intent, um, but they're, they're, I see them as sort of an add-on to the actual checking it does for, for dangling references. Lifetime seem to get an awful lot of discussion in, in the two Rust books I've got and, and various other sort of podcasts and uh, articles I've read, but I think the, the idea of lifetimes and avoiding dangling references, avoiding dangling references is quite a simple concept, but all of the syntax and details around lifetime annotations is quite complicated. Uh, and I think it's easy as a programmer to get distracted and lose track of, of what the point of them is. Uh, it seems to be a bit analogous to um, the offside rule in football, um, which is notoriously complicated paragraph of definitions. But the, the, pu the, the purpose of the offside rule is to avoid you hanging around the goal and kicking the ball in. And that's it. So once you understand the idea, offside rule is to stop goal hanging. It's a bit like, you know, lifetime annotations are there to uh, help you describe how to avoid dangling references. And if you focus on the dangling reference bit, the whole lifetime annotation stuff seems to become a bit simpler. <laughs> uh, and everything happens at compile time. So you get in all this marvelous stuff done once. Um, and then when, and whenever you run it, you're guaranteed that you're safe, which you know, is would certainly be a boon on one of my current projects where there's an awful lot of parallel processing and multi-threading going on. Uh, any, uh, I'm going to have to shoot, I'm afraid, but uh, thank you all for listening. Um, if you've got any questions, I'm more than happy to have a look at the chat afterwards or try and reply afterwards. Uh, otherwise, uh, hopefully you guys can productively chat amongst yourselves and I'll see you all again soon. <laughs> Awesome. Thanks, Richard. And um, yeah, I'm sure we'll chat about lifetimes again in the future. <laughs> Record so. Um, Thanks. I, yeah. Uh, yeah. One thing that I came across, um, it's a shame Richard had to rush off so soon. I'm sure he might be able to answer. But um, I don't know if anyone else found this when they're looking at this chapter, but the way um, the way the borrow checker and looking at kind of lifetimes is implemented now actually has a massive influence on how well Rust can determine whether or not something is still in use. And the classic example that they give is to do with, um, say you want to get an element from a map, or if it's not there, insert it into the map and then return it. With the with the borrow checker with its current implement implementation and the way lifetimes are managed, it doesn't. You can't actually do that. <laughs> um, and I can I can share the code if people are interested. Um, also, I don't want to derail the conversation talking about lifetimes, but I just thought it was interesting. So I, I, I oh, how are you? Uh, okay. I'll share screen. Um, so this is fine. Um, sorry, ignore that one. Let's just play around with it. So this, this code is fine. I don't this think is... you're sharing. Oh, whoops, sorry. 
There you go. Okay. Can you see that okay? We're sharing now? Can, can everyone see that? Or not? Yeah, it works yeah. now. Okay. It's all good. Um, so you take your, your map and then, um, sorry, this is the important bit of the code, this match statement. So you try and get the value out of the map. And then if it's there, just return the value. But if it's not there, insert a new value and return that value instead. So I just picked around some random numbers. If you try and implement that as a function, it won't work. So even though this this will run fine, um, unless I've changed something by accident. No, that's running through fine. But if I do it as a method, so here it's exactly the same. Um, I've named it slightly different, but so this is just the same match statement saying, okay, get the element. If it's there, return it. But if it's not, then you know insert it and then return it. This looks fine. But it won't compile. <laughs> and the reason it won't compile is because it doesn't know. So V here is a reference to an element in the map. And so it doesn't know that this value, this sorry, this reference is only in use on this branch and that it's not in use on this branch. So it thinks at this point that there's still a reference to the map uh, being used. And that means that it can't mutate map it can't insert an element in there because you can't have an immutable reference and a mutable reference to the same object live at the same time and the reason it works in this case the one i've commented out is because it can figure that out because it's in the same function but when you're calling into a different function because the way lifetimes implemented now is based on the lines that it kind of covers you can think of it as like a lifetime is the number of is that you know a set of lines that it's that it's valid on so if it's still live, these are the these are the lines in the code that it's valid on. But when you're doing a function call, it then is taking the whole of that line. So get or insert 32, it's saying, OK, if there's a reference, it's there for this entire function. It can't reason about it. And whereas if you implement reference, if you implement lifetimes in a different way, where you think about it as being a loan in which you look at the origin of the loan and figure out whether that's still valid, then it does work. So there's like this separate borrow checker implementation called Polonius, which currently exists. And I think one day will be in Rust, but it's not there yet. But you can like pull the crate down and you can use it yourself. I haven't done that yet, but it, I feel it's quite interesting. I was watching a video on it. Um, if anyone's interested, I'll send you it. But if you want to understand a little bit some of the limitations of the um, of the borrow checker in lifetimes, then um, yeah, that's quite an interesting concept because someone's yeah written a separate one who works on Rust Core. But the video is a couple of years old and it's still not in, so <laughs> it might take a little while. But yeah, there's more than one borrow checker implementation and concept of lifetimes. Sorry, <laughs> that was a bit of a, <laughs> a bit of a sidestep of conversation. Um. Yeah, don't know. How did it, how did everyone else find the chapter? Chapter? Any any other extra takeaways? <laughs> Just that I'm going to have to read it again. <laughs> <laughs> so it's I don't know. It, it felt to me like the uh, the the biggest chapter in terms of importance and uh and well yeah and uh how <laughs> quickly it takes to parse exactly what you're reading um i yeah i can imagine i'll be rereading this again and again and definitely it takes time to get used to right like uh, i'm only playing with small examples but sometimes like you know i, I try to run something that should work fine and then Borrow checker screams at me, tells me, oh, I had the then here or something there, right? Like, okay, but shit. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And um, uh, uh, so, so there are those crust for Rust v YouTube videos, right? Uh, beyond George and Sten, something like that, right? So, 
he also, and he seems like a very specialized person already in Rust, right? But he also hits the borrow checker sometimes and then is like, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll just won't be thinking about it now. I'll re-implement it. I remember a few instances of that. So yeah, it, it is a challenge, but uh, it just makes uh, the code try or trying to be correct, right? Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it doesn't know all our intent. So we, we sometimes know that, yeah, it's gonna work fine, but because of the rules, the, the borrow checker will, st will stop from compilation. And I guess this is like why implementing lists and so on, collections are so difficult sometimes. And then you just go to dynamic or uh, to the box, right? So the dynamic types. Yeah. It kind of forces you to deal with the most difficult bugs before they occur, but then it doesn't make the issue any easier. It's just that <laughs> it's just that it's telling you no before you have a chance to <laughs> to make the mistake, and you're like, yeah, but, but it's still hard. <laughs> but may, may, maybe it's good, right? Because oh, it just oh, tells yeah. you. <laughs> you will have that problem sooner or later. Exactly. And deal with it now, right? Instead of you saying, oh, yeah, later, and you never come back to it. Yeah. Yeah, and funny on the mm, error thing. So I'm also like reading the Zero to Production book uh, from Palmeri, but I forgot his name, right? Luca, I think. Luca Palmeri, yeah. yeah. And, and he's like saying, which is very funny because, uh, so, so he's saying, that from what he knows, uh, Rust has like the only, is almost the only one language that lets you handle the errors with the known types. And he says the other language is Java, right? With the uh, not runtime uh, exceptions, but with the specification of the other exceptions, which I forgot what, it, what they are, right? So, so yeah. It's funny because it seems like a very useful thing and then not that many languages are doing it. Yeah, I guess it kind of falls to the wayside because it doesn't necessarily help get your product out the door, which has probably been the priority of lots of languages. Is And then you can just roll your own quickly and just get over the thousand bad implementations. So, so making a proof of concept, like something that you just want to have investigation spike do and prove that it's working, right? Maybe it's, uh, yeah, something... Uh, but, you know, like in other languages, like with Java, you just can say, okay, I'm just going to be throwing runtime exceptions. And uh, then I don't have to propagate that in the, tie in the function specification, right? So, so yeah, there are ways of, uh, usually a, a ways, ways of uh, uh, running away from it, right? But still, mm -hmm. it, it is nice to have something like that in, in the code. So, like, uh, recently there is a, I, yesterday, I think I've seen uh, some vulnerability in the new OpenSSL, right? And they're saying that if you have this and that and that and that, then one of the functions is returning minus one instead of like a positive value return code. And then if something like this happens in the checking, then unknown behavior of the whole thing might go, right? And you know, it's it's again just not handling written types in something so with such a huge attention like OpenSSL, right? So so having a language that can help you with that is awesome. Just in C plus plus in C, you just cannot really go back and say, yeah, we'll all introduce that for everything that we have, right? <laughs> and and here just it was thought before the language or before the one zero version, I guess. And, and uh, yeah, it's very useful. Yeah. And forcing you to deal with like errors kind of front and center with kind of unwrap and things. Whereas like normally you just be like, well, I just uh, probably won't error <laughs> if you're writing something yourself. Whereas it's like, no, no, you need to check it. If it wasn't likely to error, we wouldn't have returned a result type. <laughs> like Yeah, and, and it being explicit, right? Mm -hmm. So in, in, in C++, what I hate really is the, the exceptions. Because like, if you don't have insight, I'm, I'm in, in more languages as well, right? But if you don't have an insight to the function and then that function might call many more functions, right? How the heck should I know if it even throws, right? Apart from no except, 
no except can throw is just it will terminate right but but still like <laughs> probably isn't what so you many people are not even writing no except right yeah uh, and then also if yeah it's crazy right because if you're like uh, adding callbacks to it, then the callback might throw. So if you want to write a function with no except, you would have to try catch uh, over that callback. Callback could have the no except specification, but again, not that many people are using it, right? So yeah, so I basically, even though it is a part of C++, so when I'm writing C++, I try to not use exceptions because it's just, Later on in the code, you, you can't see it, right? Yeah. Yeah. And those of you who don't know, Christopher will be taking the next session. I will quickly <laughs> share screen. Um, this is going to be our last meetup before Christmas, unless um, <laughs> there's really high demand. But I imagine we're getting quite close to Christmas now, so we're coming back on um, sixth of sixth of January with um, writing automated tests and an IO project, building command line program, which should be quite fun because um, if everyone gets a chance to go through those chapters before the meetup, then if anyone builds anything fun, then it's kind of, you know, it's the first chapter that's like, you know, build something, <laughs> see what you can do. So that'll be 6th of January. We'll then do the two week gap again. That'll be 20th of January for chapters 13 and 14. I think we should be able to manage both of those. The functional language features, iterators, and closures is, I think, a fairly chunky chapter. But yeah, we haven't decided who's taking that. If anyone wants to take it, then just yeah, let us know. Uh, I can help out at all. Um, yeah, and then we'll try and do a C style meetup um, in, um, at the end of January. That's kind of a lineup. Um, yeah. Shall we, shall we call it a night? Um, it's fun as always yeah <laughs> yeah it was great and uh yeah looking forward to looking forward to the next one i'm sure like lifetimes on this is it's going to keep coming up over and over again and we'll have new ways to think about it i'll stay yeah i sent the video there's a really nice video um about the polonius uh, <laughs> for a check which i would recommend for anyone who's kind of interested to see an alternative to its current implementation the, the resulting code is identical you don't write anything different yourself but it's just what you can do as a result of the way the body checker reasons about those lifetimes is the is where it's different so yeah could you share that to discord as well please kira oh yes yeah i'll do that thank you um all righty well yeah and sorry for the gate crashes i i tweeted the zoom link which was probably a mistake i won't do that in the future <laughs> and i don't like to enable the waiting room because in case people don't join or i forget to admit people um but i won't tweet the Zoom link in the future, given that we had some gate crashes this time. Um, very strange gate crashes. Mm. Yeah. Alrighty. Well, thanks everyone for coming and uh, see you in the new year. Have a lovely Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, everyone. Thanks. Safe coding. <laughs> Safe coding. See ya. <laughs>